Well, welcome everyone to this webinar on church finances for the Southern New England Conference. My name is Ken Salati, and I serve as the Bridge Conference Minister for the Southern New England Conference, and my portfolio includes working in justice and in finance. With us tonight on our esteemed panel is Tiffany Vale, who's our ACM for communications. Lee Gagan, who is our fundraising and development specialist. Charlie Kuchenbrod, who is our executive conference minister. And Mary Nelson, who is our regional minister. So we're glad um, that you're all joining us and we're glad for this panel of folks. Um, Mary is gonna serve in a role tonight as chaplain. Um, and that role is to sort of be attentive to the pastoral needs that might be expressed in the conversation tonight. You can use the chat box if you are joining us on the Zoom meeting, and you can type in there something now to say, hi, I'm here. Um, so, and you can ask your questions within the chat box. Those of you who are joining us by Facebook Live, you can also do use the same feature in the comment section by asking questions. If you want to ask a question, there's another thing that you can do. Um, in the participants window, you can raise your hand and Tiffany will be monitoring hand raising to sort of let people be able to ask their questions as, as we go along. So we're glad you're here and I'm going to invite Mary to open our time together with a word of prayer. You're muted, Mary. Thank you, Kent, and uh, friends, welcome. Let us join our hearts and our spirits in prayer. Holy One, we come before you this evening with questions and uncertainty, with opportunities that puzzle and excite us, with concerns about how to invest our time and our treasure and our talents in a moment that seems so short term and so beyond our imagining. So be present with us in this season of new life. Be present to us in our questions and in our discernment. Guide us Help us to listen, help us to be open and learn, and help us to wonder together and with you at the new thing you are doing in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Mary, for the prayer. attending to the chaplain um, role tonight. We appreciate that. So I'm gonna give our panelists an opportunity to um, say a couple of um, opening remarks. We wanna leave plenty of space and time in this hour webinar for questions and concerns that you might have. Um, but I do want our panelists, they have some opening remarks that they wanna make and I am going to call on them in alphabetical order. So David Cleaver Bartholomew, you get to go first, David. Okay. Well, um, thank you, everybody who is with us tonight. We appreciate the gift of your time. So thank you for that. I think the first thing that I would like to address is the fact that um, we are bombarded by messages from our culture in, through the news media and all around us by a scarcity mentality. Uh, we're focusing on what we are losing and what we have lost, and there's a lot of negativity around that. And that is fine because we live in this culture, but the church is different. The church calls us to wear a different set of lenses. While the culture would like us to think about what we're lacking and what we're missing and what we need outside to make us have full, happy lives, the church is different. It wants us to look with a different set of lenses, and that is through the lens of abundance. 
and to look around and say, just what the physical world is showing us is not all that there is, that there is so much more to this world, and to shift our lenses and to look at the abundance that is already ours. Look at the abundance that we have in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Look at the abundance that we have in our family and friends' relationships. Look at the abundance that we have through our church and our faith community. To look at that abundance that is already ours and that we have already experienced. And in that sense, we can say this is more of reality than what the world is telling us. That's only giving us part of it. And to recenter ourselves and to wear a different set of lens, lenses, the lenses that our faith calls us to wear. And with that, then, to realize that you know Jesus came so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus did not say that to a bunch of rich people, but rather said that to a bunch of a bunch of poor people. And from there, once we feel grounded in that abundance that we have, that we can move to generosity. And the other quick thing I'd like to say is that this gives us a time to focus on the mission of the church and while we are here. And we've noticed that people give now not out of obligation, but out of motivation. And the one, the primary reason why people give today to whatever organization it is, is because of the mission that it's doing. So look at the mission that your churches are doing and how valuable it is today and how needed it is today and um, to invite people to come into that mission, invite them into that vision of a better world, of the way in which you're changing lives every single day through your church. Thank you so much, David, appreciate that. Lee, I wanna share a few words. Yes, um, I want to talk about communication. Uh, now more than ever, communication is key communication with your donors, with members of your congregation, um, with your committees, especially those of you in the midst of a fundraising or capital campaign. Um, it's important to communicate, but what's most important is that we recognize what's going around us um, and proceed accordingly. You're not wrong to feel a little nervous right now. Um, you will have some donors that can't make a gift as they normally have, but you will also have others who will step up right now and recognize the need in our communities and in our churches. Um, like you, my job has changed a bit right now. I'm not working in the office, I'm working in my basement. I don't have uh, the capacity to print tons of letters. So what I'm doing is I am communicating. I'm checking in with my donors. I'm seeing how they're doing. I'm letting them know that I'm there and sharing what resources I have to offer. Do the same thing. Thank your donors, um, whether you have gifts coming in right now or you just thank them for what they've meant to your church in the past. Thank them. So if gifts are coming in, that rule of getting an acknowledgement letter out um, as soon as possible, that's still in effect. But do it the way you can. It might be a handwritten note card for now and then a printed letter down the line. Um, most importantly, and this is what I want to stress, continue your fundraising. It may not happen in the same way that you had planned on. Um, it may not happen in the same way that you've always done it. But there's an opportunity right now. Um, it may mean that you're moving deadlines. We did that here um, for our RIP medical debt appeal. We pushed the deadline back a month. Um, but things are different and you just have to go with the flow. Um, so that's also altering the way you communicate, your tone. Um, and mo most importantly for many of you is the way that you are receiving money. Um, so if you are not yet set up to receive money electronically, that is huge. Um, you may see that there are small fees, but a small fee on something is more than nothing. Um, so I would direct you to our website. Um, there's a wonderful resource written by Andrew Warner, uh, the Generosity Outreach Officer for National called Extravagant Generosity During a Pandemic. And he lists a chart of all different online giving vendors um, and their fees. So please, please take a look at that. And lastly, I would say be creative. Uh, recognize the circumstances and think of creative ways to raise money. Don't presume that everybody 
is struggling right now. Um, you may have folks who are willing to do their annual gift earlier than usual. Um, I'd say start with some of your biggest donors and see if they can give now instead of at the end of the year. And lastly, I'd say look to those who perhaps just received stimulus checks. Those started going into bank accounts on Wednesday. Um, and there are some people who don't need that money for everyday expenses and they be, may be willing to give that money to the church or to local nonprofits that are doing some great work to support um, you know, people struggling at this moment. So continue the fundraising and communicate. Thank you so much, Lee, for that. And Charlie, you've got some opening comments, I'm sure. Some people, um, maybe some of you, uh, may be anxious about the financial viability of your church as economic activity shrinks in response to the global pandemic. First, let's respond to fear with empathy uh, and understand where people are coming from. And let's be prudent without panicking. Uh, if you share responsibility for managing your congregation's financial affairs, you should be reviewing your budget, your financial roadmap, and considering how things will change. One thing that's reassuring is that giving is resilient. We learned after the terrorist attacks in 2001 and the market meltdown in 2008 that giving to churches is one of the last things that people cut back. Don't remind people that there are bills to be paid. Do remind people that the mission of the church to incarnate God's love and work for a more compassionate, just, and peaceful world is as important as ever. Tell stories about how your church is responding to the pandemic. Do not be afraid to approach financial angels, people that have the means to make major gifts, and ask for help. If you need encouragement to boldly ask financial angels or anyone else for support, start with Henry Nouwen's book, A Spirituality of Fundraising. It's a very quick read and much wisdom. Be very, very careful about taking on debt. If your budget was tight before the current crisis, where will you find the funds to repay the debt? The pandemic and academic turndown economic turndown will probably accelerate trends already at work. Many churches are living into a future that will necessitate smaller facilities, smaller staffs, or both. Stick to sound investment strategies. There are good resources online. We have gathered financial resources at sneucc.org slash coronavirus dash finances. If you go to sneucc.org, uh, you will see uh, a uh, right at the top of the page links to a variety of coronavirus uh, resources. My colleague Susan Townsley and I did a three-part webinar series for churches facing financial challenges called Navigating the Wilderness. You can find it at sneucc.org slash resources dash four dash transformation. That's resources dash four dash transformation. You can find additional resources at ucc.org. Uh, one of my favorite resources is the Lewis Center for Church Leadership. Their website is churchleadership.org. And in addition to Henry Nowen's book, I especially like Kitchen Table Giving by Bill Enright and a series of books written by Cliff Christopher. You can find all these books at amazon.com. Our church history is filled with both good and bad examples of how to respond to a challenge. I suspect we do better when we keep our focus on God and do worse when we focus on ourselves and the institutions we have created. Let's add more good examples. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. So we've um, asked some folks have sent us some questions in in advance. We will give you a chance over the next 45 minutes to ask questions and raise concerns with us. Um, we wanted to give a, a lot of time for your concerns to be lifted and raised. 
Remember, you can use the chat box either in on Facebook Live or on the Zoom webinar chat. If you'd like to raise your hand, that will um, lead to uh, sort of orderly, orderly conversations and questions. But there have been some questions that have already been sent in. So I'm gonna ask our panelists a couple of those questions and then we'll take some as, as we go back and forth. Um, one of the questions that's raised is about the fiscal year. One congregation in particular has a fiscal year that runs from June 1st through May 31st. Um, and that they're currently in the midst of their final week of their stewardship campaign and are gonna be looking at their budget for 2021, the first week in May. So right around the corner for their, this church that has a fiscal year that runs in that calendar way. They're concerned that many of the members are struggling right now and they want to make sound financial decisions for the church. The question for our panelists, um, this is a toss up. Should we consider waiting to finalize our budget and extend our pledge deadline until sometime in the summer? And or are there some creative suggestions as to how we might move forward? So should, should a church that's fiscal year is, is, a, is mid year and runs through the following year, should they pause? Should they, should they continue? Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? So I would say, you know, the answer depends uh, in part on the kind of response that you're getting to your pledge campaign. Uh, whatever you do, uh, you want to continue to inspire confidence by communicating effectively, demonstrating prudence and keeping the attention on the, uh, on the mission of the church. Uh, so if people are being slower to pledge than usual, you could explain that you want to give people more time. Uh, you would ask people to continue to support the church as they are able and ask people that have the capacity to do more to make additional gifts. Uh, you might consider putting special gifts into a reserve fund to be used to assure that essential ministries can continue while you take time to review and revise your plans. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the themes are communicate, uh, demonstrate that you're, you're making informed decisions in response to the information that you have, uh, and stay focused on, on your mission. David? Uh, yeah, I would pretty much amplify uh, what Charlie said and say underscore that there's nothing magical that I know of about the churches doing it on a, the time frame that they have. That's something that they have set. And it would be good to take the pulse of the, the congregation, how it's going. I would also suggest though, if they are going to extend that, um, that they might use that time to really express or communicate how much work and how much mission is being accomplished by their church. What are all the good things? How are they changing people's lives now? Make the case for why what they are doing is vitally important to their communities. Emphasize the accomplishment of their mission and why those dollars that people are giving to, to fuel that are so needed now to continue Christ ministry in that particular location. So if you're going to delay it, fine, that's, that's okay. But then really use, make the most of that time to amplify the, the successes that you're having and to get motivated people to give. So I think that's really um, an important point to be made about focusing on the mission um, and what at this moment in time during the pandemic, what is the mission of your church? Has it shifted or changed or has it remained remain constant? Um, so I think David's point, if you are going to delay, utilize that time wisely. Utilize that time to make the case as it were for, for the mission of the, of the congregation and the why of your congregation. Um, so that, that's, that, Lee, do you have any thoughts or comments that you'd like to make? I would just add that if you do change how you are doing things, be transparent about it um, and share how you got to this decision that you got to. 
David Ebenezer um, sort of comments on that in, in an interesting thought that there are a lot more volunteers now. Um, and some tasks that are paid can be replaced by volunteers without compromising the projects. So um, that's an interesting, an interesting point. We've got another question that came in earlier that I want to ask you all as panelists to respond to. Does the fact that a church, this is a really technical question in particular around the, pay, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, does the fact that a church has savings or an endowment somehow disqualify that church from attesting to the fact that they need the Paycheck Protection Program in order to keep all their employees paid? So that's a, that's a disclosure question around PPP. Anybody want to take that one? Uh, I would say that there's uh, a lack of guidance uh, and information on many questions with regard to this program. Uh, I don't know of any guidance either way. There's certainly nothing that explicitly disqualifies a church from applying because they have other resources. Uh, if your other resources are true endowments, though, uh, created by donors, uh, you should not be using those resources for operations. That would be breaching your uh, fiduciary duty. Uh, if you do have unrestricted funds, you can certainly choose to use them to support operations, even if they're currently invested. Uh, but that's going to reduce your future income. The Southern New England Conference has applied for a loan. We do have some unrestricted assets, but we are looking at uh, scenarios where we could easily be facing a deficit of more than a million dollars this year. Uh, and so th the fund, the loan would permit us uh, to defer any consideration of whether we had to go through staffing reductions uh, or other uh, painful steps. Uh, I do want to say, though, that our board of directors is aware that there are some concerns and, and they'll be reviewing circumstances before uh, we accept any funds. Uh, it may be at this point almost a moot point in terms of availability of funds. David, you've heard something about that. Right. It was just released that the uh, SBA is going to stop taking applications at this point. Um, they've maxed out and they're waiting for um, more authorization from Congress at this point. So they put everything on hold as far as the PPP program is concerned. Um, and that just went out with a, uh, an update out of the SBA in the last week or so. So that's, so the churches that did take your advice, Charlie, and tried to get things in as quickly as possible, um, were good because they got in under the program. Uh, what I would suggest in addition to what Charlie so wonderfully laid out is that in the, because of the application process or the eligibility requirements, um, the program is eligible for any employer that has up to 500 employees. A lot of companies that are in that range that have 400 plus employees, but not quite five, are gonna have far more assets than any of our, most of our churches do. So I think that they intentionally left out um, a financial cap as to what your assets could be as far as a corporation to apply for these things. So I would say that with regard to that specific question, no, I don't think it would be a, a liability or um, a disqualifier to apply to the program. Now, also, because the program has been put on hold for now, they might want to consider pursuing several of the other avenues that are available through the legislation and the CARES Act that have come across that may deal with the problems that they are trying to solve with that PPP uh, program. So I would say an examination of what purposes you were going to use that for and see if there are other ways of um, accomplishing those same means without being in the PPP program. There might be other ways to do it. And like, um, I believe the EIDL program is still up and functioning, although I'm not sure. And churches can get into that now because there's been a revision or a clarification of the rules. There's also um, some other um, avenues that churches could pursue. So it would be a better to have a conversation with that church to get the specifics of what the goals are trying to achieve. 
Thank you. Um, there's been lots of comments in the chat box, so we want to catch up a little bit to some of those. Some of those are related to this question around the PPP, so I'm going to try to try to get us to those. Okay. Um, given that given that fund update, do you recommend that they not apply the church or to continue with developing the application about the SB, SB the small business loan? <laughs> I personally, I would say go ahead through the process um, and apply because I'm fairly confident that Congress is going to come around and reauthorize more money. Charlie, what's your game? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, get in line with your application because there may be additional funds made available. We, we have heard from a, pa um, a participant that they're the treasurer of the Four Corners Chapel and they just went through the process and they had their PPP loan approved. Um, they also have substantial cash savings. The question about financial ability is not asked on the application and you don't have to submit any financial statements. You only have to show your payroll facts for 2019. Bingo. That's there, really, really good information there. There, um, there. there is a, you do have to certify that current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. Uh, that is worded broadly enough to create a, you know, a wide range of possible responses. <clears throat> there are some people that, <clears throat> excuse me, might hesitate uh, to certify that. So you know, everybody has to examine their own circumstances. Uh, I see a question about a canceled annual meeting and what can you do to meet next. Uh, on the page that we've referenced, the SNEUCC.org slash coronavirus finances. There's also a section on conducting business. And under that section, uh, there is uh, advice from uh, the UCC General Counsel about holding meetings in our various states uh, under unusual circumstances. And there is a, a great deal of information about how to use uh, Zoom as a mechanism for holding uh, virtual meetings. Uh, so uh, please look at those uh, resources uh, and uh, we will do our best to, to help you through uh, that process. Thank you. And the SNEUCC board is looking at whether or not to hold our annual meeting virtually. Um, we're, we're doing plan A. Um, which would be to meet in person, and Plan B, which would be to meet virtually. We already know of a conference, the Missouri Mid-South Conference is meeting virtually, I believe, this weekend. So um, we're looking at that as a possibility. Um, what reservations, Amy Swanson asked, what reservations does the SNEUCC board have relative to accepting the PPP funds? Uh, I can't speak for the board. I know that some of the concerns that have been raised, uh, there are some concerns about religious institutions accepting government funds. Uh, up on the, the website, there is a memorandum from Heather Kimmel, uh, the UCC's general counsel that discusses uh, some of those concerns. Uh, there's also a, an FAQ piece from the Small Business Administration that attempts to reassure faith-based organizations uh, that there won't be any negative consequences. Uh, people have raised questions about uh, should these funds be reserved for the most desperately in need? Uh, and, you know, would we, how might we compare ourselves to others in that category? Uh, so those are uh, a couple of things, at least, that have bubbled up from our membership uh, that uh, the board will review the input and comments that people have, have been making. So we do have a banker um, among us, maybe more than one banker among us, and this is Richard Holbrook who says, as a banker, I can say that available resources don't affect the PPP. I think we covered that. The programs run out of funds today. And unless you have an SBA authorization number, you can't get a loan at this time. Congress may add additional funds. So keep talking to your bank about the status of your application. They should keep working on it. 
So be persistent, I think, is he doesn't say that, but I'm saying that. So as to be ready to apply for fu if funds are made available. We got another comment um, from Second Congregational Church of Greenfield, Mass. They refused, they voted to refuse a PPP loan. Um, and they've already been approved because of their ability to continue without it using their endowment and other sources of income. So that's part of the conversation going on about who should use this, who should apply for that. Um, so there are people with the resources that are making that decision not to, uh, to apply to it. There was a question, I mentioned a certification and the question is who certifies what? Uh, the person completing the form on behalf of the church who should be an authorized officer needs to uh, certify a, a list of things as part of the application. Uh, and they would be doing so acting in their role as an officer for the church. Uh, and uh, that means they're uh, protected by uh, incorporation and all the other mechanisms. That means they're speaking for the organization, not for themselves personally.